Uh, my name is Daniel Caldwell. I'm the director of GIS for Amigo Cloud. Uh, Amigo Cloud is a startup company that's in San Francisco, and we have an online uh, geospatial platform that allows people to import data. Um, and then they can mess with that data. They can take it to their mobile devices. And I, I, am I, do I have feedback? OK. So they can take it to their mobile devices. They can go out in the field and collect data, sync that back to the cloud. Um, how many of you uh, in the room know about geospatial data already? Is anybody a little bit? Yeah? If I said the number 4326, how many people recognize that number? OK. 3857, how many people recognize that number? No? OK. So that tells me a little bit, and we'll go over those, those numbers and what makes them special in a little bit. Um, how many people were able to get the uh, Vagrant machine up and running on their machines? Got one. OK. How many people chose to use Amigo Cloud? Nobody? One? OK, cool. So uh, in order to learn PostGIS, there's a couple of different stages that we need to go over. Um, and the first question, of course, is what is PostGIS? And PostGIS is an essential to Postgres SQL. And um, it provides spatial types and spatial functions. So this allows you to import points, lines, and polygons, multi-polygons, curves, a whole bunch of different geometry types. Into the, geo, or into the database, basically making a geodatabase, and then you can do spatial operations on those, like buffer, intersect, um, areas, lengths, that kind of information, um, in the same way that you would normally do with any other data type. You, know, you can find the length of a string. You can also find the length of a geometry. Um, any, does any, how many people know about PostGS? How many, have, have you guys used it before? How many have used it before? Set it up, installed it? Few of you? Okay. So PostGIS started quite a while ago, back in 2001. It was uh, first released. 2005 found its version 1.0 release. It uses the Geos library. Um, Geos is a spatial library that was ported from the Java topology suite into C++. Um, and then eventually it moved from the open GIS design guide to the, the SQL uh, multimedia uh, document. That's where you get the ST underscore naming conventions that you'll see uh, were added. Um, later on, we have geography types. Uh, we have geometries, and then we also have a geography type. Um, and that's important because it allows you to convert uh, into world units that we're used to, like meters. Um, and then eventually in 2012, version 2.0 was released, and just in October 2015, version 2.2 was released, and so this tells you that it's still an ongoing process. There's still people, it's not one of those abandoned projects that you run into in open source communities. It's still ongoing, there's still development going on it. Every year, new things happen. They, the um, spatial operations will get faster. New spatial operations are added. Uh, most of the ones that it, we're going to go over have been here since you know version 1.0. Um, this is an intro to PostGIS, not a Let's, let's uh, you know, what's new in the latest release, and let's go look into topologies or anything like that. So, uh, but it is actively developed right now. Um, and I believe Paul Ramses is giving a talk tomorrow, and, or maybe, I think it's tomorrow. Could be later on today. But if you get an opportunity to go see his talk, I would highly recommend it as well. So there's three things you need to know when you deal with um, spatial data. The first one is coordinate systems. Those numbers I mentioned before, those were coordinate system identifiers. And if you've dealt with coordinate systems, that's going to be like the number one problem that you're ever going to run into. You're going to get data from somebody, some geospatial data, and you're not going to know where in the world it is, literally. Like you'll get it, and you'll be like, this is a polygon. These are the numbers. Where in the world is this polygon located? I don't know. Um, normally, your data should always have a coordinate system associated with it, but the number one problem in dealing with people's data is they don't know their coordinate system, or they have the wrong coordinate system, or they lied to you about the coordinate system that it's in. You try and put that on a map, and it doesn't show up anywhere. Um, the second thing you need to know is geometries. Geometries are, they need to be simple, they need to be valid, in order for you to do spatial operations on them. And we're going to go into that later. 
Um, and then spatial functions. That's probably the easiest thing uh, that you'll run into when you, when you want to deal with um, uh, geospatial data. Basically, with spatial functions, when you get to more advanced spatial functions, and you're like, oh, I have this 3D object that I want to project into a globe-like thing and intersect it against you know, a mountainside and take out that thing and do some mining operations with it. Those are really advanced geospatial functions. Um, the usual things that you run into, like 99% of the times, are real simple intersects, buffers, joins, lengths, areas, that kind of thing. Tell me the length of this road. You know, I'm going to make a project that's going to extend a freeway 20 miles. I can estimate that it costs, you know, 1.5 million dollars per mile. You know, how do I do? I know it's 20 miles. Is it really 22 point miles? You know, and if you have some good GIS data, you can just do ST length on it, and it'll find you the length of that thing. You can also say. You know, I have a city that has a whole bunch of different streets. I have alleyways, I have highways, I have a freeway running through, and I need to know how much it's going to cost to maintain that. Or I need to know how many, how many reflectors do I need to buy in order to put that. Well, you can find that out. You can say, how many roads do I have? How many lanes are there? How many reflectors am I going to need in order to fit all of those lengths? Um, so those are what spatial functions allow you to do, allow you to, to query the geometric data and find out information about it. Um, so with geometries, we have a bunch of different types of geometries. And for the most part, you're going to run into points, you're going to run into multi-polygons, and multi-line strings. Those are the most common geometries. Um, a multi-line string, of course, has line strings in it. Um, a multi-point of a group of points, um, and a multi-polygon has many polygons. An example of these are a multi-polygon is a good representation of Hawaii. We, were, we all conceptually think of Hawaii as one thing, right? It's this one state. But if you were to represent that as a geometry, it's a bunch of different polygons that are all together as one polygon. Um, and that's what a multi-polygon. A multi-line string, you run across that all over the place when you have roads. Um, you'll have a road going along, and then it'll run into a bridge, and then it might continue past that. Now, that could be two lines, which is usually what you'll find. But some people will represent it as one line that has a hole in the middle, and that would be a multi-line string. Points are pretty obvious. Cities, manhole covers, trees, all those kind of things are usually points. Um, in addition to this, we also have curves, 3D data, measure values. Those are more advanced things um, that you can run into when you're looking at geo, geospatial data. Uh, an example of that is. Um, uh, a measure, like a good example of that is when you're looking at 3D, not, not necessarily 3D data, um, it'll have an X, Y, and Z, but you could have um, a 3D data set for uh, over water um, that tells you depth, so you can have your X and Y and the depth, and then you could have a measure value, which is actually the approximate depth, depth. So you can say, I know that this place in the water is three meters deep, plus or minus two feet. Right? And that two would be a measured value. So you'll run into that. So you can be like, how can my point have four values? You'll have x, y, z, and a measured value. But most of the points you run into will only have two. Um, coordinate systems. Now, coordinate systems, like I said, are incredibly important. You run into them all the time. And there are coordinate systems, there's hundreds of them. Now, they can basically be split up into two different types of coordinate systems. First one is a geographic coordinate system. That's represented with the globe here. The globe is ba it's basically your, your coordinate system is going to be determining where something is on a sphere. Your numbers will look between negative 180 and or negative 180 and 180, or 0 and 360. So if you look at something, if you're looking at geographic data and you're like, oh, it says x, y location is 3,000 something by 4,000 and something, you know that you're not looking at data that's in a geographic coordinate system because it just wanted to be like spinning around the globe 50 times before it figured out where it was. The other type of coordinate system is a projected coordinate system. That's the one we all run into all the time whenever you use your phone or you ever use your, the web browser. We're all looking at Web Mercator, which is basically taking the globe and putting it on a flat piece of paper. Now, there's hundreds of different uh, projected coordinate system. And depending on where you are, depends on which one you use. If you're going to be sailing a vessel through the Northwest Passage, you probably don't want to use a Web Mercator system. As you can see in this little example right here, you know, the Northwest Passage is pretty extensively warped. Um, 
if you are going to be going along the freeway in San Francisco, Web Mercator is totally fine. Doesn't matter. So depending on which application that you have for your data will change which projection you need it in. Uh, 4326 is WGIS84, which is one of the most common geographic coordinate systems. It's the coordinate system that we'll be going, using today. Um, 3857 is Web Mercator. It's the one that you will see on any website and when you go to Google Maps or you go to Amigo Cloud or you go anywhere else. You're going to see data projected on your, in your browser in the coordinate system 3857, um, which is Web Mercator. Does that, does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about coordinate systems at all? Um, so some helpful questions to run ask when you run into coordinate systems is number one, is it geographic or projected? Um, this will tell you if, it, it's basically gonna tell you what your units are. are. My units gonna be in decimal degrees or are they gonna be in some funky linear unit? You don't know if that linear unit could be feet, could be meters, you know, you, you're not gonna know unless you drill down into the coordinate system and look. Um, if it's geographic, is my geographic coordinate system between 0 and 360 or negative 180 and 180? You can run into coordinate systems that go 0 to 360 around the top of the globe or not, you know. Um, and then uh, where is my 00, zero located? For 4326, 00 is all located off the coast of Africa. Um, if you have a projected coordinate system like a UTM zone, you know, UTM zone 11 north something or other, your 00, zero is actually going to be in, in, on your map itself. They have a false easting and a false northing that basically transfers your 00, zero from one place on the globe to where that, that place is, or where that zone is located. And so all of your numbers have their, their 00, zero moved from you know, Africa over and up to where your UTM zone is located. Could be over and down and that kind of thing. Um, so it's important to understand where is zero, zero located. You can also run into weird coordinate systems where uh, basically your data can't be projected. Um, you'll have a coordinate system where you're like, okay, I'm looking at North America, and I have a warped map, and Russia doesn't show up on that map because it's on the other, other side of the world or something like that. Um, and so when you try and move a coordinate to, from one place to another, it'll just disappear. You'll get not a numbers and things like that. Um, and then if it's projected, what are the linear units? Yeah, am, am I dealing with feet or meters? Most of the time you'll see meters. Every now and then you'll be on a nautical chart and you'll see nautical miles and things like that. Things that you don't normally run into. All depends on where your data came from and, and who you gave it. You know, if you get data from a nautical agency, you're most likely going to find nautical miles. If you get your data from you know, a shape file, you're probably going to run into decimal degrees and you have a geographic coordinate system. Some of the most popular geographic coordinate systems are WGS84 and NAD uh, 1983. You also see NAD 27 as well. NAD, North America datum, uh, from 1983 and 1927. So, and the the datum part of that is the part that di dictates where zero, zero is and, and what the units are and all of that information. Um, yeah. So uh, I was hoping that a lot of people, how many people want to get set up with Amigo Cloud? Um, nobody? Amigo Cloud is really awesome. It's really easy. How many people want to set up a virtual machine in Vagrant? OK, cool. You already have the virtual machine set up, right? So he's done. OK, so let me go over that really quick. Um, let me open up this. And so if you're going to set up the virtual machine, um, you can go to uh, the uh, GitHub. It's all off. One second. Let's see if this will maximize. OK, cool. So you go to GitHub, you go to Daniel Caldo PG Conf SV. Uh, this is the URL right there. And you need to git pull this thing onto your machines. And if you git pull this, then you simply run the Vagrant file. Um, so that means, of course, you have to have git installed in order to do the git pull. You can have to have virtual box installed because that's the VM runtime that's going to be used um, by the virtual machine. You're going to need to get Vagrant installed because Vagrant uh, is the, the piece of software that's going to run the virtual machine. And you also need QGIS installed so that we can have a visual representation as your, of your data. 
Um, if you'd like to set up with Amigo Cloud, just go to www.amigocloud.com and sign up for a trial account. And so if you're going to do Amigo Cloud, I'm sorry? Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. Does anybody have any questions about these things? Yeah. If you want to go to Amigo Cloud, um, I actually have it here. But you'll need to sign in. There, I'll log out. I was not expecting that. So you can do the sign up. You just type in your name, first or your email, first name, last name, give it a password. It's going to send you an email confirmation. You confirm that, and then you can log in. And so, yeah, how many people are trying Amigo Cloud? Yeah, it's a lot faster than the, the other one. Okay, how many people are doing the virtual machine? Okay, okay, cool. Um, so let me know when, I know you're done. Are you guys done, or how, how's it coming with you guys? Yeah? Uh, it's right over there. It's Postgres SQL with capital P and capital SQL. Yeah. Does anybody on the vagrant? Yeah, I expected that to take a while. I asked them to send it out yesterday for, so everybody could get it, but and they sent it out like yesterday afternoon. I was like, nobody's gonna have this. So, but yeah, once you get it, just do get get pull. Um, PG SV, and then do vagrant up. Mine's going to be. And what I have on the Vagrant machine is the whole geo stack that you're going to need today. Um, it's similar to the geo stack that we use at Amigo Cloud. And I'll go over that with you really quick because it is kind of extensive. I, I looked at some of the other Vagrant files and I was like, oh, it's so easy compared to mine. So in Vagrant, basically, uh, the important lines are this one. Your IP address will be 192.168.3310. If you're running some other Vagrant machine or something like that, another virtual machine on that IP locally, then you'll need to change that. Um, I gave it a gigabyte of RAM just because I'm like that. And then it's running this bootstrap SH file in order to install the software. If you look at Bootstrap, we can take a look at the, uh, the necessary stuff that you need to get PostGIS running. Now, a lot of this is not necessary for PostGIS. What it's necessary for is for MapNIC and Tilestash to actually give you a visual representation of the data later on. Uh, so basically, you're installing um, Postgres, uh, all the build tools, a whole bunch of image libraries for being able to do JPEGs, PNGs, TIFFs. Um, some text libraries and fonts for being able to show fonts on the map. Um, the projection engine for being able to transfer, translate and, or transform from one coordinate system to another or project from a geographic to a projected coordinate system. Then you have uh, Postgres SQL and then you install Python, install Geos, which is the geometry library that I mentioned earlier, install GDAL. GL is a, like a tool suite that allows you to import and export uh, data. And then we install finally PostGIS, so it's available in our geo databases, or in our databases. Then MapNIC, the last two things are MapNIC and Tilestash. MapNIC is a program that's gonna allow us to render the data and Tilestash will allow us to serve it out. And then I had to, uh, uninstall Pillow and reinstall it at a previous version for a bug fix. So, so yeah, we're just setting up our machines right now. Um, if you'd like to either log into Amigo Cloud and create a trial account, that will work. Or if you'd like to uh, bring up, uh, pull the conference Vagrant machine from uh, GitHub, that will work too. So. You signed up, you got an account, you logged in, do you see a sample data project? Yeah, yeah you're done then. 
at least with this, this part. Yeah, Raji? Does anybody need help setting up right now? I know there's a lot of uh, things to do, especially if you're trying to do that. Yeah. Um, so I need help just raise your hand and go there. Yeah, how many, how many other scripts are running right now? Yeah, it's taking a little while. It's fine. So, so yeah, let me know when they're done and, and we can keep moving forward. And then also, if you can install QGIS, that is going to allow you to query the Postgres data too. Um, you'll want to go to plugins and manage install plugins. And I currently have it installed. You're going to want to get the PostGIS uh, SQL query editor. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I've never tried to use it on a screen this small. So where is it? So it's actually hidden over here. It's funny. There we go. Mm. All right. All right, cool. How are the scripts running? Still going? Should take a should take a while. It's a lot of stuff. Mm. If you created the Amigo Cloud account, feel free to go poke around with the uh, the data. If you want, you can also download the Amigo Cloud account from the um, your for your iPhone or Android too, <laughs> and that's always fun to play around with. Yes. It's uh, I logged in. Um, it says that it's just flashing. Maybe we'll just have to find. Okay, Roger can help you with that right there. Does anybody else have any problems with Amigo Cloud? Any errors coming up on the Vagrant machine? No? Cool. It's a lot of stuff to see scroll past you. So, does anybody have questions about the Geo stack that's here? That is that we install are installing on the virtual machine? I know normally for conferences like this, you're not running into this much stuff.
Let's see. How's it coming for you guys? Still going? Yeah. I just started the bug out. Yeah. You just started? How's it going for you, man? I just installed the bug out. I don't know what to do. You just installed Vagrant? Okay. Did you pull this? Did you pull the repository? Yeah, you're like, I was ignoring what you were saying and I already started. <laughs> okay, so you have it up and running and Vagrant up work? Yeah, 20 minutes, that's about right. So do Vagrant up. Dude, we got three hours. What does it say? Vagrant up. Vagrant space up. And enter. And then it's going to launch everything. So when I try to open this third package, what was the name? This one? Okay. I guess this error, I think I need to install that as well. Yeah. Yeah, if you go uh, installing QGIS is kind of difficult. But yeah, you go there and he has a bit. Go back to this one. This one right here. And uh, he should have this one, the GDAL complete 1.1. Mm -hmm. So you need to install those guys as well. Okay. Yeah, I've run into it as well. How's it working for you, man? So working good? Cool. Yeah, it's taking a while. It's a lot of stuff. Do you guys know each other? Yeah. Okay, cool. You did the wise thing. <laughs> oh, cool. You already have the sample data. Actually, this is the sample data we're going to use in the class, too. Cool. How's it coming for you? Running okay, running yeah. Ended. It's downloading the uh, virtual machine. Okay. Cool. Where? Okay, so the question is where does PostGS stand in the realm of geo databases? Well, there's a lot of different spatial databases. You have Oracle Spatial, you have SQL Server, also has a spatial data type. You have the market leader, which is Esri Software, and they have their own geo database um, under Esri. Like, even if you look at what we're going to work with right now, they call it Esri Shapefile because they're responsible for creating those shapefile databases. Back in the day, before I was born, all of the data, you know, you didn't have any geo databases. So all the data was tabular data um, for the most part. And yet that's where you get things like roads, which are linear reference systems. That's if it was in a database. It might have been in a spreadsheet or something like that. Then eventually, um, sorry. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking like 1970s. As, as I'm like, where's the beginning? It's 1970s. Yeah. And so, um, so eventually, Esri came along and they developed, you know, shape files. They developed, helped develop coverages, um, and then they moved to uh, the geo database, which was a big effort back in, I think, the early '90s, um, late '80s timeframe. And then, eventually, they moved uh, from that. That was put into. Uh, with their ArcSD project, which is basically a driver that's built on top of Oracle SQL Server and um, at the time Access Database, Microsoft Access. And now they have their own file geo database type, and so their geo database has been going on. Now Postgres came along uh, in the 90s, and then PostGS itself came along in the early 2000s, 
Even Esri recognizes that it's an important geodatabase, and so they support it right now as well. Um, and it's just been getting better since then. It's perfectly capable of doing anything that the other databases are. It has topologies, it has, you know, like, except for the, the pain and suffering for getting it set up and configured, because you have to install it like that, you know, there's no good reason that I know of to use Esri software or anything like that. Now, if you're talking terabytes of information or something like that, you might want to step back and take a look at what you're doing in order to um, get the information that you need. An example of that is, say you're Verizon Wireless and you have customer data of every single customer in the United States. Is, do you want to be writing spatial queries that are going to do spatial operations and say, show me all the customers in California? Or do you just say, when the customer signs up, we find out if they're in California or not and put that as a little attribute on their data, right? Say, select where state equals CA. You know, so when you get to, to really, really large amounts of data, that's, that's where you can take a step back and be like, hmm, maybe we should think more about what we're trying to get out of this. Uh, but yeah, it, it is perfectly professionally capable of handling almost anything. I mean, DB Carter uses it, Amigo Carter Cloud uses it, uh, Mapbox uses it. You know, there's lots and lots and lots of, of commercial companies out there that are willing to stake their lives on this stuff working. So. Uh, did that answer your question? Yeah, it was more like pretty, uh, totally good. Uh, is there any reason to not use it or anything that's like a pretty strong competitor that makes a case to be used instead of it? Uh, the only reason I've ever heard of anybody not using or not want to use it is because they already own Esri software. It's like they're a government organization. They're like, hey, we bought enterprise licenses with Esri for $15 million and then you're some guy in a project and you want to come and use some open source software that is no, like go use the software we bought. So that happens quite often. But if you have, a, you know, like you're a nonprofit NGO or, you know, and you have the capabilities of setting up databases, there's no reason I can think of not to use it. Um, it can handle almost any type of data. It can handle the projection. It uses the Proj4 libraries, you know, so it handles all the projections that you run into. We're not really doing any of that today, um, but it runs in. It can handle them and do the projections back and forth. Um, you can even set up if you run into, like when you run into aeronautical maps, you'll run into custom projections uh, because you know they're flying planes over parts of the world that. You know, or you know, you'll have an aeronautical map for like all of Africa or something like that. So a lot of their projections are custom, and you can even do that. You know, you can create a custom Proj4 file and insert that into your thing, and it can handle it. It just works, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Esri is the market leader when it comes to commercial GIS software. So. Uh, let me answer this one first. Uh, if people just want to pull the data in and do client side yeah, so processing. Uh huh. Uh, I don't. I don't really have a lot of context, but a lot of people who are doing very simple things don't rely on a geo database. They'll just have a shape file. Um, which you can bring into QGIS if you like. If you just wanted to have a shapefile and say what it looks like, for me the easiest thing to do is launch my Amiga Cloud account, log it in, and it's like, oh, this is what it looks like. If Amiga Cloud can't handle it, it means there's some kind of special thing about that data, and then I have to dig into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, PostGIS could do that without a problem. And their client database? Yeah. Yeah, that can work. The Geos library is this, you know, a port from the Java topology suite, so they're probably using the Java topology suite if they're doing that. So that's, you know, if P if people want to do that, it will work and it, and it works fine. Um, but there are other options out there, you know. Like, I don't mean to too... Amigos Cloud Horn a lot, but you know you can easily lo load in two data sets and do an intersect for them in Amigo Cloud, and then you don't have to spend the time to install the machine and get it up and running and configure it and maintain the database and all that kind of stuff. 
Um, if you have the resource to do that, like you're writing a completely custom application and you're going to have that data stored locally and you don't want to share it out or anything like that, yeah, you can, you know, you can either put it in PostGS and run a couple queries, which is totally doable. In fact, you can use OGR to run those queries in order to export the data. I don't know if it's a continual thing or if it's like a one-time thing. If it's a one-time thing, then easiest thing possible would be, you know, like use a commercial piece of software and get it done. Um, but if it's like a continual system that needs to be constantly updated, like, oh, we get, a, we get a data dump every month and it needs to go into the data and then it needs to rerun the processes, then you're looking at something where maybe I should script this and put it into a database so that I can easily run the queries. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. They're probably using the Java topology suite to do that. So the Java topology suite is, is a it's a good library. I don't want to say it's not a good library or anything. Um, it just sounds like they're doing a lot of programming that they may not need to do. Um, you know, because you can. If you, they can extract out the data from Elasticsearch and put it into a Java program, they would be able to extract it out and shove it into um, a geodatabase like PostGIS. Post now, I don't know where the source of their data comes from, because how did it get into Elasticsearch to begin with? I mean, are they taking geographic data, putting it into Elasticsearch in order to do a search on it to get the data out to do more topology operations? You know, if it's something like that, then I'm like, okay, take this chunk, Throw it away, take this, put it in a database, and just run the query, and you're done. You know, I, I don't know enough about it. But if you want to talk about it we, later, we can definitely talk about it more. So, um, so yeah. So I'm going to suggest that if you don't have the Vagrant machine up and running and everything right now, how many, how many of you have it running, Vagrant up? OK, so we have three out of, OK. And is anybody running into problems installing other stuff? Other dependencies? No? OK. I'm going to still suggest that you log into Amigo Cloud so you can, we can move forward a little bit. And yeah, let's go into creating the database and see what's going on with PostGS. So go right here. No, we don't want, we don't want voice. That's the one we want. Oh, took me back to the beginning. OK. So yeah, so we should be able to Vagrant SSH into the machine, or you can go into Amiga Cloud. If you're in Amiga Cloud, see if you can create a project. You just click the button, create a new project, give it whatever name you want, um, and then create an advanced query to check the PostGIS version. If you have the Vagrant machine up and running, uh, let's uh, try to connect um, to Postgres using that as well. So uh, first we're going to create the database, then we're going to connect, and then we're going to check the post Postgres version. So for the Amigo Cloud people, I'll do a quick demonstration of what that looks like. Amigo Cloud, you come here, and you just create a new project. Um, PG uh, mine that I already have there is probably the sample data project. Yeah. No, no, I'll create a new one. You can use that one. You're more than welcome to use the sample data project. In fact, we'll be uploading that data, a lot of the sim same data, because it's using the same San Diego data. I really tried to move it to San Francisco data for this conference, but getting San Francisco data took a little while. So here you're going to run it. You're going to create the new project, and uh, it takes a little while. So what's going on in Amigo Cloud, it's actually creating a new database with new permissions for that user so that every project has its own database and it's isolated from the other projects uh, in, the, in, the, um, in Amigo Cloud so that you, know, you have some security between one project and another. You delete one as if somebody gets access to one project, they're not going to have access to another project, that kind of stuff. Um, 
And then if you have it, you can do Vagrant SSH to get into your Vagrant machine. Um, if you have the Vagrant machine up and running. Then you're going to want to move to uh, Vagrant, the root Vagrant directory. So Vagrant machines always share the data, the, the directory where the Vagrant file is, into slash Vagrant. So once you're there, you'll find the data that uh, I uploaded uh, from the tutorial. And then you can go to uh, lesson one, create database. If we look at the create database file, this is what it's doing. It's creating a user. Uh, we named it GeoUser. Uh, gave it the password GeoUser1. Uh, then we're going to create a database called GeoData. And then we're going to install the Postgres ex or PostGS extension into that database. This is going to allow us to create geometry types and, and that kind of information. Then it just creates two tables, uh, a simple table with an, one field name and another one with the geometry, just to make sure it's all working correctly. Um, so I'm going to do, so you can either run those manually or just run the shell script. And all my stuff already exists because I already ran it earlier. But uh, you should see it create the user and then create that. And then you can also uh, describe the data by just connecting uh, to PSQL and change to the geodata data set or database and then um, describe test and test geometry. If we do that, we can um, test you. I'm going to connect as the geodata user. D, I mean geo user, sorry, into the geo data database. And then we can see the test and test geometry uh, tables there. We'll look at test geometry. Um, and here we can see that this is the geometry column. And it has a point, and it's using the coordinate system 4326. If we, and then another thing you can do um, if you run into a PostGS database and you want to know what versions of libraries it's using and stuff, you can do select PostGS full version. This is a query that um, will just return the information uh, about that PostGS install. And you can see here that it outputs PostGeo, we're using version 2.1.8, Geo's 3.4, um, you know, Proj version 4.8, GDAL 1.1, it just tells you all the information. So this is going to help you know if your libraries are up to date or if they're out of date. Um, if you are using Amigo Cloud, you can go down to Advanced Queries and create a new query. And you paste that sucker in there and execute it. And it's going to give you the same information back. So, ha 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 ha, it's a tiny screen. So, yeah. So, give that a try. Give it a try to go create the database and check the version of the information. Um, and basically, Amigo Cloud is doing all the same stuff in the back end it's creating a user, it's assigning that user, it's creating a database. And then all that information, all the information for this project is going to be stored there. If you add a new data set, it's going to go into that database. It's basically the same thing that's going on, but with a nice UI. Now, so tiny, so tiny. How's that coming along? You look like you're done. You're done? Done? You guys are done? Are you done? OK, cool. How many people you were able to get it working with the Vagrant machine? Cool? 
one, uh, like one star employee uh, pupil over here. Cool. How many people use Amigo Cloud? Okay, cool. So, um, so yeah, let's continue forward a little bit. So the next step, um, now that you have a geodatabase up and running, you have <clears throat> PostGS installed, Postgres installed, PostGS installed, this huge geo stack installed, um, and you're able to create a database, you're able to install the extension with it, now you can actually start putting geodata into it. So where do you get geodata? There's geodata is everywhere. Like you go, go online and be like California GIS. There's a whole website that has all the GIS data for California. Now a lot of governments and um, commercial entities don't like you to have that data. It all depends. Um, you get really uh, schizophrenic organizations all over the place. A good example um, is one particular state in the Midwest that, or in the North or actually North Midwest that we deal with. And on one hand, they have a law that says all of their data is open. Right? All of their geodata, anything that their government produces, must be available to all of the citizens there. Right? On the other hand, you have people who are afraid to give out that data who work for the government. And so the, you run into this weird thing where they simultaneously must give data over to any citizen who asks for it, and they have to provide it on a website. On the other hand, you have these people who are scared to do that, and you have to be if you're ever going to go deal with that, you'll be like, but you have to give me this data. And like, no, and it's like, it's the law. It's, it's, you know, but that's the United States. You run into other countries where people don't have those abilities, right? You know, I can't just go, um, you know, say China or something and ask them for their GIS data and they'll just give it to me, right? That, it wouldn't work that way. And you also run into really weird laws, international laws. For example, um, I actually don't think this is still a law, but it might be the law. Um, in the United States, it was illegal to take satellite imagery of Israel. Um, so we couldn't do it. Just, it was against the law. We could do it everywhere else in the world, but you know, Congress passed a law that says you cannot, as a, a company, or go and take satellite imagery of that. So we just bought it from somebody else. So if you want to do, do it for your map, you have to buy it from a foreign country. Um, you know, and you'll just run into really weird things. But you can basically get most GIS. In the United States, you can get, we have really good data compared to other countries. Other countries, you'll go there and be like, show me your road network, and they won't have it or something. Um, and, but in the United States, we have good data. So there's uh, three different ways you can get data into, um, get your spatial data into post-GIS. Post the first one are, is shape to PGSQL, and there's also a PGSQL to shape in order to get your data out. Um, that one comes with PostGS, and it's a good tool. We're not going to use it here. Um, however, the uh, QJS query um, plugin, it uses this tool. Um, we're going to use OGR to OGR, which is a GDAL tool. Um, and then you can also use like QGS. And there's, there's various other companies out there that, you know, like Esri, you could use Esri software to talk to a PostGS database and add tools and stuff. And a lot of database management systems will be able to handle this. Once the extension is there, you're basically just creating a table. Um, but we're going to focus on OGR to OGR. It's a really good tool set to know. Um, they have a lot of tools. It's a, it can handle vectors, it can handle rasters, and you can use it for a lot of different things. So in order to do this one, this is the next exercise. If you're going to use Amigo Cloud, you can go to uh, the 02 directory, and you'll see some state and city data there. And you, they're in zip files. And you just um, open up Amigo Cloud, uh, Safari here. Go back to your data set view. And then there's an upload data set. And you add the file. And I don't want to be there. Yeah, go to data sets, and then the upper right, there's a button for uploading right there. Here, I'll show you, show you again. So you click on data sets here, and then you click on upload data sets here. And then you can add a file. And I'm going to go to documents, projects, data. And then in 02, import data, you can select California cities. It's a zip file. And I think we're in the U.S. states. I'm sorry? You can get this data by pulling um, the repository from GitHub. Yeah. 
you can't pull the repository from GitHub? Okay. And then you can, can you download it with, uh, you should be able to download it as a zip file. Yeah, if you can download archive slash master dot zip, that'll give you a zip file that has all of the data from this in it as well. Uh, go to slash zero two and you can upload cities and states. And, and it's California cities, so I took a cities, actually downloaded all the US cities, and then I trimmed out California just to kind of shrink up the data uh, for this tutorial. But it actually had all the US cities. Yeah? Okay. Sure, sure. No worries, that's why we got, we got plenty of time. So go to your browser and type in HTTPS colon. Slash slash github.com. GitHub with a B. Yeah. And then slash Daniel Caldwell. With a capital, no, just capital D, annual, capital C, Aldwell. D W E L L slash P G Conf S V 2015 slash, uh, yeah, slash archive, A R C H I V E slash master. I can help you. Yeah, dot zip. Master. Zip. Z I P. Yeah, and that should download all of the data as a zip file. Okay. Is, any, is anybody else having problems pulling the data from GitHub? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. OGR to, or okay. Um, the PG to SQL, or let me go back to the slides so I can make sure I get these right. The shape to PG SQL only works for shape files. And then it's reverse, PG SQL to shape also only works for shape files. GDAL, OGR to OGR works with a, like over 40 something different formats. So you can take in a CSV and you can put it in there, or you can take in an Excel, or you can take in Mr. Sid, or you can take in, um, in this case, we're gonna do the same thing, shape files. And you can also extract data out into those formats. Now, not all plugins are installed with uh, OGR to OGR GDAL just out of the box. For example, if you have Mr. Sid, Mr. Sid is a commercial proprietary um, compression algorithm that is actually pretty darn good, and they use it to compress raster files. And um, you can, you know, I think you can get the uh, extractor where you can decode uh, for free, but you can't encode for free. You know, so you might be able to get a Mr. Sid and import it, but you can't actually create a Mr. Sid unless you pay money for that part of the, the thing. Other ones like, you know, Convert into C comma separated values, Microsoft Excel. There's actually a file geodatabase for Esri that Raji wrote and, and I helped him on a little bit. Um, you know, that uses the Esri libraries, and to get that one you must compile the Esri or get the Esri SDK for file geodatabases, compile it separately and, and it'll work. Uh, we use it in Amigo Cloud, so if you had a file geodatabase, you could upload an Amigo Cloud, but I didn't include the instructions for that for this tutorial. So that's one of the reasons why I wanted to go over, use OGR to OGR, because it'll, you know, GDAL is this really big library and has all these great tools. You can convert rasters to vectors, you can use, you know, vectors to rasters, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. So it's a really good tool set to know how to use, and so that's, that's why I chose it for this. Yeah. 
Shapefile is usually the most common format. Um, you will also see CSV is very common. Okay. Microsoft. <laughs> yeah, I'll show you what a shapefile looks like. I have it there. That's a, that's a good idea. So, um, but yeah, shapefile is by far the most common that I run into. In fact, when I'm searching for data, I usually want to have it in the shapefile format. If somebody's released it in some other format, you know, the next best thing is CSV. Um, the problem with CSV is it usually doesn't have field information. If somebody has a file geodatabase from Esri, that's actually really valuable too because um, it will have extra field information like dom domains, you know, like this field can be one of these six values, whereas shapefiles will lose that information. So they're, they're more, more dummy. Any, any other questions? No? Okay, cool. So uh, how many people got, it import, got the data imported into Amigo Cloud? Yeah? Everybody, how many people get it in, were able to import the data into, um, into uh, the Vagrant machine? What exactly are you doing to import the Vagrant? Okay, so. Is there are multiple scripts? Yeah. So let's go to zero two. And here we can look at California cities. This is the shapefile for California cities. Like Raji mentioned, it's multiple files, not just one. Um, the DBF has the tabular data. This has the geometric data. Um, there's usually a proj file with it too, but it's missing in this case. We'll fix that. So there's a couple of import scripts here. Let's take a look at the first one uh, for import cities. Um, so this one is a simple OGR command. And basically, I have a slash overwrite. So if it already exists there, it's going to overwrite it. Skip failures. Every now and then, you'll run into data that has some kind of weird corrupted geometry. And normally, it would not import anything if it runs. And it'd be like, hey, I imported 50,000 features, but this one had a problem, so nothing got imported. So a lot of times, you put skip failures, you get 99%. It will outpour, output the failed data, so you can take a look at it later. So it's, you know, it's pretty rare, but it does happen. Um, NLN means new layer name, so I'm saying I want this, this thing in Postgres, PostGS to be named California Cities. I don't want it to be named some other weird name. Um, then this is the destination, and the destination format is Postgres SQL. And uh, the destination information for Postgres is a connection string. Basically, it says, you know, I'm connecting to geodata on the local host on that port with that user and that password, and that's where you're going to connect and put this data. If this was something else, like a shapefile or something like that, then you'd just be like dash f Esri shapefile, and then the name of the shapefile, right? Um, it's a little bit more complex because you're connecting to a database. And then California Cities here is the name of the directory that contains the shapefile. So that's what all of these. Uh, different parameters mean. And there are a lot more parameters. So you can like query the data as you import it to shrink it down. Say, I only want to import all of the data that you know, has a population over 100 and, and things like that. So if you want to know more about that, you can do man OGR to OGR. And uh, it has all of, the, all of the different formats. Whether, you, know, you can append data, you can up, overwrite it, you can update it. You can run queries on it. You can, you can do a lot of different things with it. But here, we just want to use it to import it into it. So if you run the import cities shapefile, it'll import that data in. Then the other one, import cities 4326, uh, cities 4326. The difference here is that we give it a, a dash s SRS and a TSRS. So I'm basically saying the source spatial reference is 4326, and the target spatial reference is 4326. The reason for that is when I imported that data um, into Postgres, this one right here. Um, That's D California cities. We can see that the WKB geometry is a point, but it doesn't have a spatial coordinate system. 
Um, so you're like, that's curious. Why does this not have one? So why did you know? Why does this? This is an example. This is data that I downloaded from a government website, right? And it's like, okay, give me the shape file that has all of the all of the data in the United States, and I get it, and I'm like, it has no coordinate system. Like I said, coordinate systems are like the number one problem you're going to run into. How could somebody give me California data or give me city data, and that has all these points, but not tell me how to put it on the globe, right? So if we look at the shape file. That's what the city's, um, city's shape file info shows us. So go back and take a look at it. And we can see here that the layer's spatial reference is unknown. And then if we look at it, so what I've done here to fix that, one of the ways of fixing that is to just import the data. And when you import it, you can say, I know that this is 4326. And I want to import it as 4326, even though it's not there. And that's what the import cities 4326 is showing us how to do. So we can import that, 4326, as well. And then it'll be in the database now. Now there is a um, cities Postgres SQL info right here. And if we look at that, Uh, all it's doing is saying, you know, it's saying connect to my Postgres data database and tell me the summary information. The SO means summary only information for the California cities and summary only information for California cities 4326, right? Um, and then once we look at that, you can see that even though it had no spatial reference, um, it was still able to import the first one. And when we assign it 4326, we, we see that this is the spatial information uh, for that. Does that make sense? So I downloaded some government data, tried to import it, didn't look right, looked into the spatial reference of that information using OGR to OGR. It tells me there's something wrong, it had no spatial reference. I looked at the data previously, and I was like, OK, what are the coordinates of this data? They looked like data that. Um, was in WGS84, and so I said, yeah, it's WGS84, and I imported it. Now, that can be pretty iffy right there, because uh, I'm just basically making that assumption. I'm assuming this is WGS84 data. And that means 00, zero is off the coast of Africa, and you know, based off of the decimal degrees, this is where it is in the world. I could be wrong. Sorry. I could totally be wrong on that. That data could have been in NAD128 or, or NAD83 or NAD27 or something like that. But this is city data, right? And so as a result uh, of knowing that, like how big is a city? Well, when you zoom way in, it's this huge polygon. You zoom out, it becomes a point, right? So you zoom out, you know. So it means that the accuracy of this data is very, very unimportant. Like if I say that the city is where I'm standing, this is the point on the globe where the city is, well, guess what? This is the point too. So I can easily estimate which one of those is. And it doesn't matter if I'm off of by you know, even 100 meters or something. I'm still going to have a point where that city is, and that'll be OK. Now, if you're dealing with data like wastewater and water data or gas pipelines, you can't do that, right? If a gas pipeline comes in, you get gas pipeline data, and it comes in, you know, they are going to know that the pipeline is buried here versus here, you know. And they don't want to send somebody out there to dig a hole to fix a leak or something like that or to check a pipe and not have the pipe be there. So depending on where your data comes from, what coordinate system it is in is very important. And in this case, I'm just guessing. I'm like, eh, I'm guessing. It's U.S. city data. It doesn't really matter. If this was wastewater data, that wouldn't matter. Or if it was... Uh, gas pipeline data, or um, there's a lot of data like that, that that does matter. Some of it doesn't, some of it does. Um, you know, ships must know how deep the water is, give or take, you know, so they don't go aground or they don't run into a shipwreck. And, and it's really interesting. If you create a nautical map and it says the shipwreck is right there and the boat goes through right here and runs into it, they can sue the person who created the map that told them wrong, right? And so, can be very important to make sure you, that your data is accurate and, and cartographically correct. Um, so that's 
US city, or that's cities. Now the next thing is states. And we can take a look at the states data set. Um, states shapefile info. So this one right here is in GCS Northern, North America 183. So this is an NAD uh, 183 datum as well. Um, and then we can import that. Uh, import states. And then we can also import it as a different coordinate system. For states 43. And this one right here, I'm saying the target spatial reference is going to be 4326. Giving it a different name, target spatial reference 4326. So this is going to take it in and do a transformation on the data before it inserts it into the data set or into the database. And it's important to understand the distinction between a transformation and like assigning a, there's a difference between assigning a spatial reference, transforming your data from one spatial reference to another, and projecting your data, right? And the difference is assigning one is when you guess. I think this data is this, I'm assigning it this spatial reference. So I'm gonna set the SRID. I know the second one, transformation, is I know the data is in this coordinate system, but I need it in this other coordinate system. There's a lot of different reasons why you would need to do that, mostly because you have other data in the other coordinate system and you need to do mathematical computation between the two. So you need to transform the data. And then the third one is the projection. With a projection, you're basically saying, I'm gonna take this data that's on a globe and put it on a map, right? I need to take something from a spherical surface and put it on a, a flat surface. So those are three different things, but people will use, when you talk to people, they will use them interchangeably I, even though they're not exactly the same thing. Like, are you sure what you said? And that kind of thing. So here we're doing a transformation of the data, um, which is different than the cities where we just did an assignment of the data. So we can import states in 4326. And then we can just take a look at them inside of Postgres. States, Postgres, SQL info. And we can see, once again, this is Definitely 4326 for the first one, or for the second one, and NAD 183 for the first one. So, so yeah. Now, if you're gonna import this into Amigo Cloud, Amigo Cloud in the background always uses 4326. It's gonna transform your data whenever it comes in. If you bring in something that it doesn't have a coordinate system, it's gonna try and assign it that particular coordinate system. So if you upload the zip files with California cities, you're gonna find that all of the data is in 4326 there. And that's the same thing that we've done here. Yes, they're city points. It's not, not polygon, uh, they're not city. Usually when you look at government data, you'll see you know, cities will be like points. And then for the areas, it'll be like city area. Or it'll be, um, you usually see like boundary is the, another term, you'll be like city boundaries. So like look for, if you're gonna search for data, look for areas, look for boundaries. Um, and a lot of times they call them urban areas rather than cities. You know, cause you get an urban planner and they like the word urban. And so they put urban in a lot of places. Um, so yeah, so you can do that when you import, but PostGIS itself is using the same projection libraries that OGR is, right? They all use Proj4. So um, you, can actually you can also fix the data um, when you're inside of PostGIS as well. So for that, we can take a look at, at how we would do the same thing in, in PostGIS. Here, we're gonna alter the table, um, alter a column, WKB Geometry. WKB Geometry stands for well-known byte underscore geometry, and it's uh, just the format that it uses to store the geometry into um, the database. So you'll see the, the term WKB a lot. Um, and basically, it's gonna do ST transform in order to transform the geometry uh, into 4326. So, yeah. And so if you run that, if you, if, if you have the, the Vagrant machine, you can run that. And it'll connect, it'll alter the table, and then if you look at the information, uh, Postgres, right, now you have W just, 84 for the second one, and you also have WGIS 84 for the first one. So just because your data is in PostGIS doesn't mean you're stuck. It's still malleable, you can still transform it, um, and you're not, not stuck. You can also fix the city data as well. 
right? Here you're going to alter the table, but instead of doing an ST transform, you're doing an ST set SRID. So it's a different type of query, right? Setting the spatial reference is different than transforming it. And you run that. And it'll connect. It runs the altered table. It's basically the same thing. And then you do, um, you look at the info, and now both of them will be WGIS84. Does that make sense? Yes? OK. This? Uh, use case when you need to do a transform like this is when you're taking in data from many different sources and they're in different coordinate systems, right? Yeah, it's, it's good to have one common coordinate system that everything gets transformed to. And then when you intersect things and do buffers and stuff, you're like, hey, I want to intersect, I want to buffer that, I want to intersect this. You'll know that mathematically they'll line up. They're using the same coordinate system, they have the same zero, zero, they're in the same place in the world. If you have a different zero, zero or something like that, the system will try to do those transformations in the back, but it's just good practice to make sure all your data is in the same coordinate system. And that everybody understands that. You're like, OK, everybody, what's our coordinate system? Some organizations like NAD183, some of them like you know, WGS84. If you are in Alaska, you don't use either one of those, right? You'll use the, uh, you know, one of the polar coordinate systems, right? Um, if you need data accuracy down to you know, gas pipelines, you'll need a datum, a coordinate system that's accurate to where you are in the world. Because you know, the world is a sphere, isn't a sphere, it's this oblong shape with all these weird things going on. And so there's hundreds and hundreds of datums that are specific to various places in the world uh, in order to make sure the data is as accurate as possible in that place. Um, and then you can mathematically transfer them from one to another. But so you'll be like, okay, I want to get, you know, say I want to get all the road data. And you go to each state in the US and you get different road data. You might find they're in different coordinate systems. So, so it's important to make sure, you know, when you import your data, you have a common coordinate system. If you're having weird things go along, like I buffered this and I got weird errors or something like that, or I'm not getting the data I expect, this is the first thing to check. And you know, I know it's, this is like data management stuff, but it is vitally important if you're dealing with spatial data to understand coordinate systems. So does anybody have any other questions? No? OK, what time is it? It is 10.44. So we're supposed to have a break at 10.45. They said they would have refreshments outside. Yeah? <clears throat> Yeah, basically common coordinate system. Yes, I have not projected. This data is all on, on the globe right now. Like conceptually, when I look at this data, it's all on a sphere. It's not well, not, not even conceptually. It is being it's being stored. Its coordinate data is being stored on a sphere. I personally like storing data on a sphere um, because I can project it to anything. You know, so it's like. Yeah. It could be. Usually not, though. Yeah, but usually you don't run it. You usually don't run into that. Even like if you go to Google Maps or something, and you're like panning around, and you look in the URL. You'll see coordinates there. Those are Latin long coordinates. Those are coordinates on a globe. They're not, not storing it in meters that you happen to be looking at. So usually what you'll do, so, so say you have that problem. You're trying to find from here to here on a map, right? And you'll specify the points on the globe as Latin long coordinates. And then it will take those coordinates and project them onto a um, equal distant projection in order to measure the distance, right? Because it needs to know that all the distances are the same. Or it will just do the math and be like, OK, so this is a line that goes along a sphere, and I need to calculate the distance right there. So there's, you, know, you can project it there and then do that. That's what you would do if you had a cartographic map. You need to make sure, depending on which map you're showing, it's going to give you what you want. So if you're measuring area, you need to use an equal area projection. If you're using measuring distance, you need to use an equal distant projection. 
you know, if you're just looking at a map on Google Maps, Web Mercator works great. It's not equal area, it's not equal distant, but when you zoom in, it tells you where you are on the map, and that's good enough, right? So it, it really depends on the application that you're right. here so, doing. So what I'm saying is that all links are easy to uh, close your head and navigate the module. That's what, that's what I do. I always keep things a, and as coordinates on the, on the globe. So it'll be latitude, longitude. And you, yeah, and then it can pick whatever one, whatever projection it wants, you know. So you can usually project that quite easily. Raji, do they have the reset freshments out there? Because they said that we were supposed to break at 10.45. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry? This is the plugin, right? The plugin allows us to have this geometry column here. It allows us to store this coordinate information. It allows us to do the ST transform. That's a post-GIS uh, function. STSRID, that's a post-GIS function. Um, if you uninstall the extension, you'll see this all just breaks miserably. It, it won't understand what any of these things are. Mm -hmm. so a whole lot of functions, yeah. Yeah, it's a couple of tables, a whole lot of function, and a custom data type, the geometry type, um, which they've changed a couple of different times from a couple of different formats. And uh, so, yeah, that's basically what it is. Does it also create indexes on the... Yes, it can create spatial indexes uh, in order to query the data more efficiently. Um, I'm not really going into that, but it, it will do that. You know, so instead of trying to figure out things, it just breaks it all up into squares and rectangles because the math so much quicker and easier. So. Uh, other than the spatial extensions and stuff, no. You know, I, I we'll go over that. Yeah, I have exercises that doesn't intersect and a distance for the next couple exercises as well. So, did you have a question? Um, yeah. The other term that I hear about is, uh, shift, is grid shift files. Grid shift files. Yeah, it looks almost exactly like that. You also will see projections that, that shift coordinates too. They'll have a false east and a false north in order to reset their zero, zero. So if they're like, my coordinate is, you know, 1,000 meters by 1,000 meters, one by one, right? Well, like they only have so many numbers in a 64-bit number and everything, and they need to shift that, the zero, zero, to a different place on the globe so it's closer to where they are. So the numbers, otherwise, the numbers would be like, you know, negative 420 million by 800, you know. So because those numbers don't really make sense and they're hard for people to conceptually understand, um, they'll shift uh, the coordinate system to a different place on the world in order to start in meters um, from there. So you, you see that. The UTM zones do that. All right, let's get back to, to this. Now, 
Um, I had some people ask me some, some questions and they want to see buffers. They're like, oh, okay, this is great data management stuff. I want to see buffers and things like that. Um, so the next thing I had to go over was geometry validity. And this is the next data. So once you have your data, once you have PostGIS installed, you're able to import data. You're able to make sure your coordinate systems are valid and good and consistent. The next step is making sure your data is itself geo or topologically correct, making sure the geometries are good uh, um, and you don't have weird things. And so there's two concepts with this. There's simple and valid. Simple means that you have no anomalous points, you have no self-intersections, and no self-tangencies. And the reason that's important is you can't say you have a, a line that's going like this. You can't, like, how do you, how do you know which way it goes and that kind of thing? And, and it'll self-intersect itself. And that makes a lot of the, um, basically, the geometry math mess up. That's the best way I can describe it. And then for validity, validity really poly applies to polygons. Um, for example, in this, in this one right here, these are valid polygons. You know, I have a circle, that's valid. This is a, a polygon with a hole, you know, I have a lake or something, that's valid. These are invalid right here, where I have like this extra point in my polygon just sitting out in the nowhere. It's called a spike. This one right here, I have my interior uh, hole that is actually outside of the polygon. It's like you can't calculate areas and things appropriately like this. If you have a polygon that's inside out, you know, that itself can't, like how do you calculate the volume of something that's like infinitely that is there? It's like, you're not gonna be able to calculate the volume of it. So um, I had a demo for repairing, uh, I had a demo and exercise for repairing data. I think I'm just gonna go over this and then we'll move on to that and go on to uh, buffering and stuff like that. So let me just show you how this one works. Um, so in Amigo Cloud, I'll, I'll show you using Amigo Cloud. So figure out how to get there, log in. Um, close, uh, let's see, upload data sets, add a file, uh, checking data. I created this polygon test. I had to create this data manually to make sure it was broken. So I'll show you some effects of broken data. So for example, this preview is incorrect, right? It's because the data is broken. Uh, this is what the data looks like. Uh, minus, minus. So you can see here that this polygon right here is invalid. Um, it should not be rendered. This should be a hole right here. And this is actually invalid as well. This is a figure eight and it's invalid. These two are valid polygons right here. But you can see if you have data that's rendering incorrectly or something like that, that's usually a sign that you have invalid data. Postgres and almost any other geo database allows you to have invalid data. Um, however, almost every single manually, manual tool for inputting data requires uh, geometry checks as the data goes into the database. So if you're actually out there digitizing a feature, that data is most likely gonna be valid. Where does invalid data come from? Applications who are running processes. So they're like, I want to intersect all this stuff in Union, blah, 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 and it just runs a computer program that man mangles data. That's going to give you invalid data. You also run into it with old data or government data or exported data. Some exporters are just broken, and they will export bad data. Um, so it's something you need to be aware of, and it'll mess up all of your queries. So to fix that, there's uh, two queries. There's st uh, is valid. That's one uh, geometric function that you need to know. So you can do uh, select st is valid um, wkb geometry from and this data set right there. Execute. And you can see here that I have two valid and two invalid geometries. And we can also fix them by doing st make valid. Execute the same query. And now we can see that the data rendered correctly because the geometry has been fixed. And this one, it renders the same, but the geometry is fixed there. And if we want to check that and make sure it's valid, we can say check and make sure the geometry is valid after I made it valid. And we get true, 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 true. Right? So ST is valid and ST make valid are just really critical functions that you need to know when you're getting weird 
geometry. When you execute a buffer and it returns an error, and you're like, why would that ever error? Most likely you have an invalid geometry that you need to fix. Um, so, and if you'd like to go and look at the exercises, um, uh, sorry, zero, 03, uh, checking data. Uh, you can see that those queries that I just input put are here. You have the import um, and then fix validity, uh, right? This is just doing the whole ST make valid, ST multi. Um, for this case, I actually had to do ST multi because um, <clears throat> you need to, <clears throat> ST multi will take a polygon and it'll give you the multi version of it. So it'll take a polygon and give you a multi polygon representation. A lot of times if you have just a polygon data set and you have an invalid polygon and it needs to turn it into two, you know, like you have a polygon that is overlapping and it needs to turn it into two polygons, it'll turn it into a multi-polygon. So you just need to make sure your data is a multi-polygon. And that's what the ST multi is doing there. So the queries are there if you'd like to go run them, um, but we're gonna move on from this one uh, to uh, exercise four, which is finding manholes. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, yeah, those two are, are kept in, in sync with each other. Um, you might run into I mean, when we did the post-GS post full version and you saw all the different libraries, like Geos is this library, Proj4 is this library, you know, GDAL is this library, you know, you might run into weird version numbers there um, where you can, somebody might compile one of the libraries to get the most recent version in order to get a fix or something that they needed. But for the most part, you know, they all are pretty much in sync. Yeah, it's not, not a whole lot you have to worry about, but if you want to have the latest and greatest, then you're compiling stuff. Um, and I, once again, I forgot to repeat the question. That was uh, one of the guys asking uh, if the versions are kept in sync. So the next scenario is identifying all the manholes along a street. Um, here we get to look at uh, geographies versus geometries. Uh, geometries, in this case, are specified in decimal degrees, um, and geographies will be in meters. Um, we're also going to be using ST buffer, ST union, and, and ST intersects. Um, so in order to do this exercise, uh, you, you need to import the manholes and streets. You need to find the street features, um, buffer the street features, union the buffer geometries into one, and then insect the single, intersect the single geometry against the manhole. Uh, covers. So let me give you a quick demo of that as well. Zoom in here. Data sets, upload data, add a file. And we're going to see if that works. Sorry, I gotta zip these up real quick. Uh, loads, let me create a zip file here. And then zip. Uh, Okay, add a file, there's my roads, and there's my manholes, choose those guys. Upload those, and it'll, in the background, it'll start processing and creating the data sets. So, if you have the sample data, I believe it has this, uh, the roads in there. I'm not sure if it has manholes, but they're both here. Um, 253 manholes and 251 rows. So these are the queries that I created in order to run through this exercise right here. Um, let me go over them really quick. Um, so 
The first one is uh, just selecting all of the roads on Island Avenue. It's a street that goes across San Francisco, I mean San Diego. And then the next one is, um, this is where you're buffering it, so you can see all of the different buffers that it creates for each segment. So this, this road goes across San Diego and it's broken into a bunch of different segments, one for each block. And then this one will, this query will buffer it. So um, we're buffering the geometry by 0.0008 um, in 4326. This doesn't make any sense to anybody here because none of us think in decimal degrees. So the next example is using a geography. Um, where we want to say convert the geometry to a geography, buffer it by 10 meters, and then convert it back to a geometry um, in order to set the spatial reference to 4326. You don't really need to set the spatial reference to 4326. It will work anyway without it. Um, so this gives us the buffer, but gives us a more accurate buffer. Instead of trying to figure out things in decimal degrees, you can figure out things in meters. Then the next one is uh, this one right here. Um, with selected road as select one as OGCFID, select STSRDs, ST union, ST buffer. So what's this, what is this doing? First it takes um, a query and it says, give me all the geometries for Island Avenue, okay? And then it's going to, um, uh, yeah, it's, give me all the, all the roads for Island Avenue, take those geometries, buffer them by 10 meters, union them into one geometry, right? Uh, make sure that geometry is in 4326, which is the coordinate system that we're going to use. And then this one as OGCFID is only needed inside of QGIS um, in order for the QGIS plugin to work, but you normally would not need that. And then it says, it, it assigns all of this to uh, kind of like a subquery called selected road. And then it says, select star from manholes where it contains, where SD contains um, WK geometry from selected road, WK geometry. So basically it's saying, take that buffer geometry and tell me all the manholes that are contained within it. And then this one, this is the final query for, for figuring out um, all the manholes that are on that street. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions? No? You guys want to try this? Yeah, Raji, what's your question? Yes, I'm going to run them now, but I wanted to make sure there are any questions before I go through them. No? Okay, cool. So let's run these things in Amigo Cloud. Um, so I go to Advanced Queries, and we do select star from my roads first. Yeah, okay, that tells me all the roads. Cool. And then we add where, um, forgot the name of the field. RD30 full. It's equal to ISLAND Avenue. <coughs> so. so we get 17 rows. Uh, returns, so there's 17 blocks, and basically this feature is broken into 17 individual lines. So now we need to uh, buffer this, so we're going to do select WKB geometry, so I only need the geometry field, and then we're going to do ST buffer, WKG geometry, comma, 0 0.0000, right, maybe that one. Uh, execute that, and we can see that now our lines have turned into this buffered line, and we can see that as the segments are there, they have this rounded end cap. You can actually change this rounded end cap if you want to go look at the documentation, there's that, that. But we don't want that, we want to specify it as meters. So I'm going to change this to geography, and execute that. And we won't get anything back. Okay, so the first time when I executed it, it returned it as a geography type, which can't be rendered on a map because um, it's in meters and this map is expecting decimal degrees in the background. So here I turn it back to a geometry. So you need to convert it from a geometry to a geography, buffer by meters, and then 
turn it, convert it back to a geometry, and then you'll get this. So this is actually a 10 meter buffer around the streets, which is far more, uh, which is what, really what we want. So then we can do, so I have the buffer, now I wanna select the uh, um, manholes. So, so we'll do with, uh, okay, sorry, it's with that as that, right? As, uh, no, we wanted to union first, sorry, my bad. So we have the, ST union, ST buffer. So this is gonna get me all of the geometries and it's going to uh, union them all into one. Buffer that geometry, the SQL error. I think I'm off by, I'm missing. Let me check. Sorry. SD union, SD buffer, W geometry. I want to do that. I misspell something. Position 30. Oh. That's what you want. Okay, sorry. So yeah, so by unioning it, I've turned it into one geometry right here. Um, so your, your question earlier, like how do I buffer the point if I have the user's Latin long, how do I do that? This is how you do it. Instead of taking a geometry from the table, you would just have the user's Latin long, and you can do st underscore make point, and then you specify the Latin long for that, and it'll generate a point geometry, and then you can buffer by 30 meters uh, by doing that. So if you're wondering how I can take a user's Latin long or just take any coordinate, you can just construct the geometry um, using st make point, or you can use like st make line if you have two points, um, and just construct them. That's very useful if you get CSV data from governments. So a lot of governments will ship CSV data, just has Latin long coordinates, and you have to do ST make point to actually create a geometry before you're gonna be able to do geometric operations on it, so. Um, so this is 10 meters. So if I got rid of the geography here, it'd be in decimal degrees, and then you have the 0 0.0008, because I'm saying, you know, eight one hundredths of a decimal degree. Um, Roger? Yeah, for this? Okay. Um, we'll do make point. So the documentation for, for this, um, so whenever I'm looking for documentation, this is what I search and I always brings this up and then I always go up to home, which tells me this is all of the different functions that you can use. Um, in order to, to process your, your data. So you wanted to see SD buffer. Uh, there's make point, make line, point from text. Uh, there is it. There it is, SD buffer. Returns a geometry covering all points within a given distance from the input geometry. So does that make sense? Is there any other questions? Uh, the buffer? I'm gonna try and find all the manholes on the street. The line that I have is a street center line. So it goes down the middle, so I'm like, okay, I'm on the street. Maybe buffer like 10 minutes because the manholes will be off by a little bit. Um, any, any other questions? Okay, so let's go back to Amigo Cloud. So I have and I have the one geometry was the union of all of the streets for Island Avenue. Um, then you can do select star from uh, manholes. 
where uh, st intersects, actually I'm doing st contains. Uh, um, WKB geometry. And there's my manholes. So I basically did select star from manholes. This is my manholes data set where ST contains, and I'm saying, then doing a subquery to get the, the one geometry, um, and then my manholes WKB geometry. And then this returns me the 11 manholes that are on that street. Is that, any, any questions? You guys wanna give this a try? Yeah, let's see, uh, give, this a, give this a try. You can do it on Amigo Cloud, or you can do it and post, uh, post GIS inside of the virtual machine, either one will work. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Okay, so in QGIS, uh, first you need to connect to your post GIS database. You got, do you have it connected? Okay, and then you refresh this and you can see the tables. Okay, and then you do the SQL. Do you have the SQL query editor? Okay, so you bring up the query editor, and uh, the with statement might run into problems, but um, yeah, so you need to select the connection down here. For some reason, it never remembers the connection that you set. You need to have a temporary path set. You have to click this and actually have one. It won't just choose a temporary path. Um, Type all that in. And I actually don't have the data in. Let me insert the data. Port roads, import manholes. Okay, is it giving you an error? Now it works. Now it works, okay. It doesn't display? Do you get an error or anything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, your query, this is the query output right there. Yeah, but it's not. Okay, so let's launch the query again. ST buffer, geometry, geometry from ST. Do, um, uh, right before the ST buffer, put um, one space as OGC underscore FID. <coughs> FID, and then comma, and then execute. <laughs> there you go. So the, the question, yeah, the question that he, the, the issue that he had um, when he ran the query is that this tool, um, the SQL editor right here, it's using this PG SQL to shape, um, and there's a custom field uh, that is in all the databases, data sets. So if we go to, so I just imported manholes here, right? And if I go to PSQL uh, dash U geo user dash D geo data, uh, there's W for password. And sorry, and I look at the roads database, um, the URSD roads. Um, you can see that there's this OGC FID right here. Knock, null, default, next value, blah, 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 blah. OGC FID is a special field. And it's basically the primary key for this field. It's an incrementing list of numbers. Uh, you know, zero, one, two, three, two, on and on and on, and it has to be there. Um, so whenever you import data in from a shapefile or something, this field will be created. Sometimes with some importers, if the field already exists in your data, it will import that as well. And that's, 
So when your thing was, when, when he was running the SQL query uh, for post, uh, or in post, or in QGIS, um, the resultant table that came back from the query only had a geometry in, in it, a WKB geometry, and it didn't have that OGC FID field. And so the tool, um, PGSQL to shape, was not able to create the temporary shape file uh, because the field was missing, basically. And so by doing the one as um, PGSQL, it adds that field in there, then it's able to create the row in the shape file, and then you're able to see it. So if you run into problems with things not showing up, that's one of the, the issues there. So. Yeah. If, if you have multiple geometries, or when I run queries with multiple ones, I can just select the OGC FID field. Um, so uh, in the examples that were here, find manholes, uh, you can see right here where I select OGC FID. Um, and I'm doing this OGC FID particularly because in post G or in QGS you need it there. Um, I didn't have to do that on Amigo Cloud, right? I could just select the geometries, it'll get the geometry. Because Amigo Cloud is a little bit closer to the database. This one's a little bit, it's close to the database and when it runs a query, it's the conversion into a shape file to be able to show you the results in QGIS that is causing the issue. Um, in Amigo Cloud, we're actually doing a create table as. So it's gonna create this whole new table. When it creates a whole new table, it's gonna have an OGC FID field already there and that kind of thing, so it just shows up. So, um, is anybody running into any problems? I wanted to get to this example particularly because it's a cool example and it shows you some powerful things. Yeah? How do you query? Okay, so to query the data, Question is how to query the data in, in QGIS. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Oh, I'm going to mouse. I'm like, yeah. oh, my story. <coughs> I have so, to set up the connection, but I don't know where the connector is. Okay, so <laughs> let's, let's do this. Let's add the connection back in. Yeah. Test, yeah. Geo data, yeah, geo user. And geo user one. It said it was connection. To okay, software. and then you click OK, and it goes away. Yeah. And it magically appears. Okay, so now you have the connection mm -hmm. there. Oh, you're not saving your password. Not yet. Yeah. You just just save your password there, okay. and then you need the plugin for uh, plugins. And just install plugins, okay. and it will fetch, and then type uh, PostGIS. And there's, yeah. This is taken, okay. Post GS SQL Query Editor. And then install this plugin. Uh -huh. And close. And now you have the plugin right there. So, okay. so yeah, save the, save the password and stuff so connect, and then you can start running it from there. Okay, cool. Uh, so, if you click Browse Datasets, yeah. it'll, and you select the dataset from there, yeah. it'll insert the number that it is. Oh, okay. So oh, yeah, so that looks right for you. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, but it's going to be different for everybody because. Uh, to get that name up there, though, wouldn't you have to? Yeah, control? yeah, you have to switch the names out. <clears throat> this is because we abstract the name uh, when we insert it into the database, and, and it's um, just to make sure that uh, nobody can duplicate. <laughs> we don't want somebody inserting two tables with the same name into the database at the same time. And then we also need this here. That's one reason. And then the other reason is uh, Amigo Cloud has a REST API behind it. So you, everything you're doing right here is going through our REST API. And when you access the data sets, you know, in the REST API, you're like w whatever slash data sets and then the number, right? And so we need to make sure that number is unique as well. And that number would correspond to that number on your data set. So. So is there any way for me to give aliases? To do aliases? Uh, yeah, you should be able to do the as statement now. So you can be like, with this, as that. Uh, 
Okay, I, I missed the question. What? If I want to say instead of queen against data set three two, you know, if I just want. Yeah, you to wanted to say to SD manholes or something. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, Take a view on top of it. No, you, you can do with. I think you can do uh, select star from this. Ad, like you have to use an as statement to basically oh, okay. reassign the okay. the data set three two three nine four as that, and then you can use the other variable in the at query itself. It's kind of iffy to do that though, but. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. Where did you set the path? Sorry. The path issue. Uh, you just mentioned that we have to set the path explicitly. I tried running this way, and this is all it gave me. <laughs> um, I, that's where I ran it. So it's it seems. Oh, okay. But this is the, the path is none. yeah, and then you just click here, and then you choose a folder somewhere on your system. Just to give it a temporary path. Yeah, I just I just named created a temp directory, and then I just selected it. So you just I just did like I went to users, okay. and then whatever user you are, mm -hmm. and then I did a new folder, but I don't think it didn't give me. That's really odd. Why can't you? Yeah. Maybe I'll just create a folder here. Or you can just select that folder. I mean, it doesn't matter. It's just going to put your temporary. Sure. Yeah. Okay, perfect. And then run and see if it works. To be stuck at this point. I know. It's just the thing. Okay. So this is this command is not found. Mm -hmm. um, I ran into the same error before. So uh, can you uh, can you see if you can run that command from your locate this command on your machine? Okay, so user bin pgsql tshape. So you have an user bin, mm. which is kind of surprising. Um, and then you go to qgis preferences mm -hmm. and system, and then you can look at the path here. So if you have an user bin, it should be able to find mm -hmm. it. You might need to restart in order for it to requery that or something like that. Okay. Mine was actually an user local bin, so. I had to you do this, and then um, I added a, you know, I did a append oh. that path. So maybe you can do that or something. But I, w I would try restarting first. Okay. Because um, maybe you had QGS and then you installed the other stuff or something. I don't know. No, I didn't. Need it, but yeah, I didn't yeah, yeah. I didn't have it above. Okay. Yeah. So, but it needs to find that in order to turn it into a shape file. Okay. If it can't find that. The other way of doing it is to basically execute this in the virtual machine mm -hmm. under PSQL. You just yeah. do create as and then select blah, 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 blah. And you create a new table, and then you refresh here, and it'll show up. So. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Is anybody else having any issues? You're a smart one. You're like, I'm going to use Eagle Cloud. Click, click, click. How's it coming? Okay, cool. Yeah, if you need to learn the Migo Cloud, or you need to learn PostGS, it's great because it saves you a lot of configuration. But I did both because I know some people really like to get down into the database, and, and other people just, I want to know what queries are available. So I tried to. Try to make sure both were available. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I thought there was a column name in this actual data set, but it's mm -hmm. not. It's actually, it's, it's a calculation, is it? No, it's a column. Oh, okay. it, it's the shape column. But it gets this name Amigo. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's different. So every, every data set that Amigo Cloud creates, gets this Amigo ID as a unique identifier for the records in that data set. And we just leave, it's just like a, yeah. And well, you can't see the OBKB geometry because it's a geometry. And so if you wanted to see more about that, you can do the ST. I was expecting to see binary or something. Yeah, I know. We don't want to show this huge binary string. But you can do like ST as text, and it'll convert your geometry into a text. 
And then so you could do like STS text and then WQV geometry, comma, WKV geometry. And then you'll get like the text representation of the geometry. The geometry will be shown here. And then you'll always have the Amigo ID. So, OK. Uh, how's it coming for you, man? You doing good? Uh, don't don't use the width inside QGIS. I think that's why I included the. There's a second version of it uh, down below the width one that has this one right here that has it all in one big thing or something. Yeah, don't use width inside QGIS if you're using QGIS. Just, oh, sorry, friend. Just try and stay away from. Yeah, did that one work? Uh, it produced something. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Not all like I don't I don't know why it doesn't work, but it just doesn't. <laughs> so let's see. Are you guys good? Yeah. You guys good? Yeah. Okay. I think almost everybody's done. What's going on? OK, so you need to have this statement here as well. Because this one, this select statement, mm -hmm. is refer referencing selected row, okay. which is this thing right here. So those, it, it looks like two different queries, but it's actually one. And oh, did you edit it up the top or something? Yeah, let's get, get rid of that upper one, that upper select. Yeah, delete from select there to that semicolon because you have two queries in. Oh, okay, okay. I got it. Yeah. And then <laughs> now let's try it. Uh, SD manhole. So. Okay, I find this correct and correct. Yeah, I just use the browse data sets and that'll, that'll do it for you. Okay. Can you go to the, are you guys good? Yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, did it work for you? Cloud box, basically, can I upload my data in here? Yeah. And can I integrate that with, uh, can I do a kind of mashup or something of another? Do I have APIs? There? Yeah, this is all built on top of a REST API. Okay. So if you go to, sorry, my bad. And you go to oh, API. Oh, there yeah, okay. this has it all. So in fact, our UI is all using this REST API. So everything you can do in the UI, you can do through the API. <coughs> OK, so I think everybody got that done. Is yours still getting started? OK, Roger, you want to help her a bit? I'm sorry? I don't know. Do we? I don't know if we support comments. Yeah. You can always save a query here, oh, okay. and then it'll save it into your list of queries, and you can give it whatever name you want and, and stuff. So I quite often save queries that take me a while to figure out. OK, so it's 12 o'clock. We have half an hour left. Um, I wanted to go over the rest of the geo stack. Um, the, the next one, the next query is uh, basically the same thing, fine hydrants. Um, you import the data here. But the difference here is that it's using the ST distance. Um, to find the nearest three hydrants, right? So you basically, um, I have a one point, which is my business location, and then I'm going to be querying um, the hydrant, the distances between the hydrant data sets, sorting by distance and limiting to three um, in order to find the nearest uh, hydrant. And I'd like to go over this, but I'm going to move on. And I'm going to show you the rest of the geo stack that you would need to be able to render a map. 
uh, because once you have geodata, that's great. You don't ever deliver to anybody uh, you know, the output of SQL queries. They want to actually see a map. So, um, uh, CD6, exercise six is render tiles. So, when we installed on the Vagrant machine, um, we installed Mapnik and we installed Tile Stash. Um, let me go back here so I can describe this a little bit better. All right, gonna, so Tile Stash is a, basically a cache of uh, tiles, and tiles are little images or little bits of GeoJSON that describe um, a little geographic area. Um, so the user is gonna request the tiles. Um, the web server is going to request um, the tile from Tile Stash, and then Tile Stash is either gonna look into its cache or it's going to look or it's going to request um, the tile from the provider of tiles. Um, in this example, we're using Mapnik as the provider, Tile Stash as the cache. Now there are other caching, um, or there are other caching pieces of software out there. I particularly like Tile Stash, uh, Amigo Cloud and Raji and myself. Julio and a few others uh, have worked to maintain this project. Um, and it's an open source project. It's available for anybody. It's written by Mike Magursky. I don't know if you know him. He's a genius geo developer working for Code for America now, I think, I, I believe. Um, and so in this case, our, our provider is Mapnik. And you can access them just using a standard URL, HTTP server, layer, Z, X, Y. Z is the zoom level. Um, starting at, at, at uh, uh, zero and going to 20, usually. Sometimes you get like 22 or something, but it's just as you go down in Z levels, you zoom in, basically. Um, and then X and Y is, is the X and Y location in the grid of tiles, not like a Latin long. So it'll be like, you know, zoom level four, tile three by five. Um, and that's how the tiles are, are accessed. And then, what tile stash does is it says, okay, this person is asking for this tile. This is the geographic boundary of that tile. And then it runs the query or it sends that geographic information to the provider. And then the provider's job is to run the query or somehow provide that map. And that can be done in different ways. Sometimes you're asking for tile three and four and it's a proxy provider. So it just says, hey, give me tile three and four from some other server. Um, so using that, you can, you, you can access the tiles from, say, OSM or Google or something, and you can have your own cache of those tiles. Don't recommend doing that for any uh, commercial software, but it's really handy for um, people who provide uh, web tile map services. And you'll find those in various areas. You can get them from Esri. You can get them from um, the census people. You can get them from USGS. You, you, you'll see tiled map services available. If you want to have a cache for that on your server so that you can serve them out faster or more reliably, use tile cache for that. Um, you can use Mapnik and it'll generate an image. You can use Postgres and it will generate GeoJSON and give you that back. Um, so Mapnik, being the provider, it gets this request to create an image around this geographic area. It looks in its config file and it runs whatever queries it needs to get. Um, most commonly you'll run it, you'll see it querying PostGIS or you'll see it querying a shape file. Um, a lot of people use this. CardoDB uses this. Mapbox uses it. Amigo Cloud uses it. It's, Mapnik is like the way of rendering data for open source tools. Um, so here I've created a um, tile stash file, config file and a Mapnik XML file that defines the Mapnik uh, or defines the style of the data. And we're just gonna render US states. It's just a real simple data set, but it's big enough that you can actually see the tiles at kind of scales, at different scales. And uh, if you're gonna use this in Amigo Cloud, all you have to do is mark the data set as public. So let me show you what you do in Amigo Cloud real quick. Uh, so I'm gonna save this query. I'll save, okay. Oh, my bad, sorry, oops, wrong one. Okay, so here I can just click public map and that gives me a preview. 
And this is just a simple preview. Um, and here I actually have multiple layers. Uh, and I'm using, I'm using Leaflet to load multiple layers. But the layer that is the blue roads is, the, is reading tiles from Amigo Cloud. Um, and it's doing exactly the same thing. It's requesting the tiles from Tilestash. Tilestash is requesting the style from Mapnik. Mapnik is rendering the tiles. It gets back and it gets cached. The benefit of tiles, it means the second time you zoom in or zoom out, tiles are generated and it'll be much faster. So um, if we go look at that, uh, we can look at the style first. So this is the XML style for Mapnik. And uh, you define a map and you say, I wanted it to be in 3857. This is the other number that I asked you about earlier. It means Web Mercator. So the, the tiles coming back out of this are going to be in Web Mercator. Um, and then I want you to connect to PostGIS. I want it to be on the localhost of this thing with this user. Um, I want you to look for the table states 4326 and give it a style name. Um, this is just random names. I actually grabbed this style from Amigo Cloud itself. And the line symbolizer is going to be a stroke with this color, an op opacity of 1 and a stroke width of 1. And then it's going to fill it with this other color um, and give it an opacity of, of 30%. So pretty simple stuff, but as you add data sources, you get more complex maps. So if you were to look at something like OSM, OSM can be rendered in the exact same way. Um, there's the config files for OSM have 70 something different layers. So it's gonna be doing 70 different queries. You can mix and match data sources. So I can say, I want you to grab this data from this shape file, and I want you to render it red, and then I want you to grab the roads from PostGIS, I want you to render it green, and I want you to grab this you know, point from my NORAD point, and I want you to render it like a little Santa icon, and you can build you know, the where is Santa map, and it'll update. And, and so you don't, you're not stuck with one, to, one particular thing. This uh, one particular data source, this thing's job is simply to get a geometry and color it in a certain way. It can handle text, it can handle colors, it can handle different layers, um, and however you want to build your map is up to you. Um, if you really want to learn more about this, I would recommend uh, Tile Mill. Is Tile Mill still around or has that been replaced with? It w with Maxbox Studio, right? Yeah, Mapbox Studio is a good one. Amigo Cloud is good. It's not as complex as that one. Um, but you can, they all, all render the same things. Then if we look at the tiles configuration, this is the, a, a JSON configuration file for tile stash. <clears throat> and the important one here is this first one. Basically, I've created one layer. It's named states 4326. Um, and has a, a small buffer around it. And this is useful for when you have text. So you don't really need it in this case. But when you have text and your text is going to run off the edge of a tile, you basically want to say, I'm rendering this tile, but I want you to render it this big so I don't cut my text off when I go rendering the tile next to it. So the tile next to it will be this big, you know, and then it'll render you know, a lot larger. And then this one a lot larger, and the text will overlap correctly. I want the projection to be in Mercator and use the Mapnik file um, style 3857XML. And in this particular case, we're not using a cache. You have different types of caches. You can cache to S3, you can cache to disk, you can cache to memcache if you want it really fast. Um, in this case, I'm not caching at all. I'm just using a test cache so that I can see the effects of it. Um, and then we can run the server. So this is running tile stash on port 9001. Um, if we look at it, it's just running tile stash's server um, using the config file I asked it to on the port and exposing IP 000 so that I can access it externally from the machine. <clears throat> and I can't pronounce the name of the web server. Wurz, Wurzberg? Wurz, Wurzzoig? That's the name of the web server it's using, and, and it's a common web server. I can't pronounce it. Wergzoig. Okay, 
My German-speaking friends are laughing at me right now. Um, so we can run this sucker, and then we can access it from our other web browser. And so this tile stash bellows hello tells me that my tile stash server is running. Um, and then this is the initial preview. It centers around San Francisco. And yeah. Sorry? Where are you? All right. <laughs> Uh, I forgot how to, yeah, it's shift. Shift double click and shift double click will zoom out and shift clicks. So this is our state's data. It's slow enough right now that you can see the tiles coming in as it generates them. It takes a little while. But, but the, the good example is you can see how each one is an individual tile. So does anybody have any questions? And this is the beginning of getting a map that you can actually share out with people. Um, so like Amigo Cloud, we're doing the exact same thing. We create the tile stash file, we have the cache there, and we're serving it out um, publicly available if you mark it as publicly available. Otherwise, you're not gonna be able to see it unless you log in. You need to have authentication credentials to look at it. Um, in this particular case, uh, this is doing the same thing. Uh, we render it as a light blue color. If we want to, we can change the colors or anything. Um, but yeah, I wanted to make sure that we got full circle. So I bring my data in, I fix the data, I fix its coordinate system, I repair any invalid features, I can run my queries to find out the information that I want to find out, and then I can serve that data back out to people in a map so they can see it. Does that make sense? Any, are there any questions? Yes, this is, this is all, all of this stuff is available on uh, GitHub right now. Um, and the slides are on GitHub as well. So I'll be providing the, I've already provided all of that to the conference and I'm assuming that they'll share it out, but if you, uh, if you need it, it's gonna be on, on GitHub probably permanently. You can always fork the repository, make some fixes. If you find any queries that are wrong, I just submit a pull request. I'll be more than happy to add it in, so. Yes? Okay, so if I wanted to show the manholes on the map here, making me go off script. Uh, style 3857. Uh, what you could do here is you would add another style. Uh, for rendering points. This is a line symbolizer and a par polygon symbolizer. Manholes would be like a marker symbolizer or an image symbolizer. And then you would add another data source um, for that one. This one right here is targeting states, but I could easily change it to SD manholes um, and change the symbolizer to, to points here. Um, and that's about it, and then you add another layer. So it's like I have a layer with name, data set, blah, blah, blah. I'd add a layer, add a data source, add a symbolizer, and then it'll put it on top. So. so it's pretty straightforward. It is a lot of stuff to type out, but there's tools to help you do that, like Mapbox Studio. Or if you don't want to do that, you can, if you have data and you just want to upload it to the internet and render it, Amigo Cloud helps you do that. Um, and there's a few other companies out there that do the same thing. They allow you to just upload your data. You can symbolize it. It's using this in the background. Um, but if you don't want to set it up, there are commercial solutions out there. So, so yeah, does, does anybody have any other questions? Yeah? It all varies. I can tell you 30 years ago, most of them did not exist. <laughs> but a lot of them have been coming up, like uh, I think Geos was 2006, and Mapnik, uh, I don't know, I would have to go look, but, but basic. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, there's this huge ecosystem that just keeps growing and more developers keep coming in and stuff keeps getting cooler and cooler and all seems to be coming out of San Francisco. But anyway, so any other questions? No? Okay. Um, oh, sure, sure, go for it. Gotchas to work, look out for. Um, I would say the, not for, for post GIS, the main gotchas, I think I've covered them, is coordinate systems messing up um, and invalid data causing your queries to break and things like that. Um, that's why I kind of hammered on those in the beginning. Uh, other than that, I can't really think of any, any strong gotchas for post GIS. I mean, it works really well. What? Yeah, you you'll want to index fields that you want to you want to query. Um, yeah, in the geo arena, like the biggest issue that you run into is licensing. I think when you want to get data, you'll find that there's data some data you can use for some things and some things you can't. You know, like like Google Maps has has good base map data and and but you can't can't use it unless you're using Google Maps. So, you know, Esri is the same way. You can get an Esri base map, um, but you have to pay a whole lot of money. And then there's weird restrictions like, oh yeah, you can pay us, you know, umpteen thousands of dollars and have the base map, but you can't put it on a mobile device, you know. Um, yeah, so I'm like, well, okay, that doesn't work. Like, what's a mobile device? Is iPad a mobile device? Like, some of those things are kind of, Kind of iffy, um, and so yeah. When you're looking in the geo arena, always make sure your data is licensed correctly and you're not doing something wrong uh, when it comes to sharing it out. But yeah, I can't think of any other any real gotchas for that. Um, so anyway, I think that's about it. Uh, I can go over the other exercise or. I can just be around if you guys want to go over the exercise for finding hydrants, and I can be around to answer any questions uh, that you need. Um, does that sound good? All right, cool. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm.